Welcome to A Reader's Paradise. For book lovers, audiobook listeners, writers, and for everyone who loves a great story. Hello, and welcome to another edition of A Reader's Paradise. Say, if you like the interviews that you're hearing and you like the literature that's being performed for you, please take a moment to give us a review and also make sure that you subscribe to the podcast. Your subscription and reviews help listeners to find the show. Well, folks, today I have a master storyteller and a bit of his, a bit of a, a historian. Uh, Arnie Bernstein is a nonfiction writer who loves exploring the forgotten stories of American history. He is the author of A Swastika Nation and Fritz Kuhn's and the rise and fall of the German-American Bund. Um, he has been interviewed throughout the United States, Ireland, England, Israel, Australia, Poland, and Russia by newspapers, radio stations, television, and news digital media such as blogs and podcasts. Arnie, please take a moment to say hello to everyone. Hello, um, and thank you for having me. I'm a big fan of the podcast. So uh, it's really an honor to be here. I hope people get something out of this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am more than certain that they will, because this is going to be a very interesting uh, podcast, because you, you, sir, are a nonfiction author. So unlike the fiction authors that have been on the show before, what you write is about the truth, about what's going yeah. on and, and uh, you know, history and those sorts of things. And so today we're going to be focusing on one of your novels that has given you um, that you've gotten a lot of praise over, and it's called Swastika Nation. Would you tell us a little bit about it? The book is about the German-American Bund. It was a 1930s American Nazi movement. Um, they dreamed of making America a fascist state, and their leader, Fritz Kuhn, you know, fancied himself as the American Hitler. Um, that's where the term swastika nation comes from. He and, and he wanted this to be like like a Germany with the swastika flying over the White House. Um, and the subtitle is kind of a uh, a nod to the famous book, uh, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, um, because this was a rise and an inglorious fall. Oh, wow. You know, I think that's a part of American history that, you know, uh, many people may not. Uh, realize because from what I've read, you know, of the work, I was completely drawn in and completely fascinated by what was happening, you know, during this during during the time of his life and what he was what he was going through and what he was doing and you know how he got to this particular mindset of you know trying right. trying to transform a, a nation. Why do you think why do you think that was so important to this? to him and others like him, what was, what do you think was the driving factor behind this? Uh, they were Nazis. I mean, it really, it really was that, unfortunately, that simple. Um, they were, after World War One, of course, as we know, Germany was, went into a severe, severe recession. Um, you, you know, how many thousands of marks did it take to buy a loaf of bread? Um, and of course, the the Treaty of Versailles was it that they yeah, it, no. basically Germany, yeah Germany had nothing, um, and there was a vacuum to be filled, and Hitler filled that vacuum in a sense. Um, he rallied people, um, found you know people to blame um, somehow or other. Uh, people rallied to somebody who is mercurial and as gripping is Hitler. I mean, he's a horrifying figure, of course, in world history, but he managed to get, you know, do what he did and, uh, you know, and get millions of people to believe what he believed. And of course, they're still out there, too. Yeah. And now that's the interesting thing, because although you're writing about, you know, the first and second world wars and, you know, that time in world history, we are living in a world today where this is this sort of mentality and thinking isn't so far removed. Um, no, you know, and I know we were talking about, um, you know, before we came on, we were talking a little bit about Charlottesville. Right. Uh, I, it's always been there. And now of course it seems emboldened. It's, 
easy, and I'm often reluctant to do it. Um, it's easy to complain to compare what's going on to Nazi Germany, and of course the uh, president of the United States to Hitler. Um, I wouldn't go that far, but he certainly has operated with you know a wink and a nod. And, you know, the very fine people on both sides, um, and of course, David Duke, you know, saying he's saying exactly what we want. I'm sure um, a lot of listeners have seen uh, Black Klansman and mm-hmm. the way that tied, that Spike Lee tied what happened at Charlottesville to that story. And, of course, the larger story overall of, of that kind of madness. Um, I thought the way Lee did it was brilliant and relevant, and uh, he tapped into what these people have tapped into. There's always been this strain within, you know, you know, the collective unconscious of some people. And uh, it's, it, it, it periodically manifests itself as it did in the 1930s, um, as it did with the clan of the, of the, you know, certainly the reconstructionist era and of, you know, the resurgence of the clan after the release of birth of a nation in 1915. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with the, what happened, of course, in the 1950s. And, you know, again, we're seeing that resurgence yeah. in America. And there are parallels in the book that, um, in my book, that it's it's unsettling to me. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 it, and it truly is. And I want to take an even, you know, you know, pull back and look at it from, you know, an even higher bird's eye view and look at this in right. terms of human history. Because yes. certainly this sort of behavior, ideology, and those sorts of things are not, you know, hemmed in by the 20 and 21st centuries. They, ha- they, they have been around throughout human history, and not only in Europe, but, you know, all over the world. Of course. Of course. I mean, the, 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 if people want to read a really interesting book of Forgotten History, The Rape of Nanking is uh, fascinating, and it's about how the Japanese invaded uh, Nanking, China, and the horrors that went on there was just incredible. Um, and uh, that, that's another World War II story. But of course, I mean, this kind of stuff is is going on since the dawn of time. Yeah, since the dawn, since the dawn of time. And you know, it, you know, and I think I think about you know other empires that have you know come to rise and fall, and other dictators and leaders and warmongers. Oh yeah. And, and all of that, you know, the, you know, you know, world history is full of them, you know, and and it's it's what I find fascinating or at least interesting or maybe even sometimes a little saddening is that no matter how much we lose and how much pain it causes. You know, the human story still has this component of destruction and of almost yeah, yeah of destruction and, and I will say tribalism. And it's oh, yeah. and, and, and it's like one of those things like when will we as a species as as intelligent and as brilliant as we are in all of our diversity and all of our genius learn to stop doing this to each other? And the sad reality is I don't know that it's possible. I mean, there's always been the demonization of the other. Mm-hmm. And with that demonization of the other um comes those horrifying things you know that make people want to you know annihilate and slave um dehumanize I, it's it become you know, in large and small i mean it's it's you know going you know i mean from slavery through you know the what happened with uh you know the native americans in the uh 19th century to, you know, of course, the Holocaust, uh, to, you know, the, the lynching, Jim Crow eras, and how many hundreds, if not thousands of unnamed people are, you know, were, you know, went through, were lynched, um, you know, homes burned down. It, 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 when you think about the the history of all, it, it's it, uh, depressing is not even close to being the right word here, but it's the strain that runs through us. It's it. In ways large and small. Yeah. You know, even thinking about, you know, you know, French history and the beheadings in, in Europe. Oh, and, yeah. And what we learned over there were beheadings were a um, were a, a community activity. 
you know, oh, yeah. where, where, you know, that. so, so sometimes when I look at history from that perspective and then, you know, not to say that it was right or anything, but to look at uh, uh, atrocities such as lynchings and those sorts of things, it, it you know, it's not so, it's, it seems, it, it's just um, a progression. It is just a, it's just the same, it's just the same beast with a new face. Um, exactly. You know, so, so, you know, again, you know, uh, you know, even in, you know, ancient, you know, you know, African cultures, some of the atrocities of yes. against mankind that have happened there. So no one is guilt free here. No one is guilt free. You know, we all, no. you know, every I think every culture has its 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 burdens, if you will. Uh, now, with this, let me let's let's back up a little bit and talk about. You know, this is such an important piece of work that you have written so that, again, the, Thank you. The, yeah, so that the world just never forgets, you know, the things that happen. Because sometimes you can get newer generations that come along and they think they're brand new and they, they can solve everything. And, um, you, you know, they have they have the solutions and answers. And uh, but they forget, you know, that the earth has been here long before they got here. It has seen. Oh, yeah. So much, and it will be oh, yeah. it will be here long after you long after they're gone. And one of the things that you have to do is look back at you know history and understand, you know, and and not revisionist history. Look at the raw truth of what took oh, place, yeah. because people and one of, one of the reactions. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, one of the reactions I get commonly from readers or when I do presentations or something, people say, I didn't know there was a Nazi movement here in the United States in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, people, George Lincoln Rockwell, you know, of the 19, you know, 1950s, uh, 60s, um, you know, people knew about that and the infamous Nazi Skokie March, um, which I should point out was my high school years. Um, I went to Niles West High School and uh, in Skokie. And Wait, so so back so back up. You, you said the you said the Skokie Nazi March. That's something I'm not. Yeah, oh yeah, there was it was an infamous case where um, a group of Nazis they were mopes. Um, in, they had a headquarters in Marquette Park, Chicago, um, which was then a pretty much all white um, ethnic all white community. Um, today, I think it's largely Hispanic. But they uh, they decided they wanted to, you know. Long story short, have a have a march in Skokie, Illinois, uh, which at the time in the mid to late 1970s had one of the highest populations of Holocaust survivors. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I've been in New York City or Jerusalem, and they wanted to march and give their you know make a speech on the courthouse steps, um, not the courthouse, the village hall steps, and um, that was as I said, that was my high school years. Um, so the, these things have been going on and i think that's what really sparked my interest in this kind of stuff mm-hmm. um you know as i was about 14 i found in the street a pamphlet um from a nazi group it scared the crap out of me um i never told my parents about it it, it really scared me and then i think of the nazi thing in skokie started a couple of years later so there were hints that it was coming uh, it, it was an incredible, crazy time. Um, I would invite your listeners to, if they don't know about it, to look it up because it, it, it really came down to a freedom of speech issue. Um, and I've often said, and this came up in the book too, when I was in Swastika Nation. And I'm a free speech um, absolutist. I mean, you have the right to be obnoxious in this country. I mean, you don't have the right to walk into somebody's church and you know start screaming, you know, this, that, the other thing, or walk into somebody's schoolroom and start screaming this, that, the other thing. But the right to give a presentation like that, you, you have the right. The, the difference is, and I, I always like to point this out, um, in Berlin, you know, or you know, in the American South or what have you, um, the right to speak back to counter it with more free speech was not there. Mm. Now we have that right. And so, yeah, you got the right to be obnoxious in this country. Um, and when, you know, it's, but you also have the right to be right <laughs> and, and say the right thing and do the right thing and counter that horror with, and so what I use a lot actually, but I mean, counter this, those horrifying people with the right thing. And I think we see more of that, I think for all the, terrible stuff we hear and we you know we're living in one of those times again um and history repeating internet, itself yeah and and with the internet it certainly it, it gives it a wide open forum um where people can operate anonymously too uh 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, here you and I were having this conversation, and you know, we can go out there, and I'm, uh, you know, the listeners uh, understand as well as anyone else, you know, that we have these conversations. We counter it. Yeah. Um, and it's frustrating. I mean, we live in a. It, it, it's frustrating considering what's going on, um, and leadership by tweet um, <laughs> that people just, you know, soak up. Uh, you know, I, I I I read his tweets daily. Um, and there weren't any this morning. I thought, oh my God, is he sick? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, yeah, it, it, you know, it, it, I mean, it's all. It's also, um, the slight's not the right word. It's also, it's just pathetic, and it's it's so snippy. It's it's almost like, you know, I don't want to, you know, um, de- you know, cheapen or something. But a lot of it is like high school mean girl stuff. Mm. Um, and yeah. it's just very flippant and um. Immature, you know, knee jerk racism, knee jerk bigotry, but it it, it certainly has a a form that we were considering, um, you know, when you know I, the the Nazis wanted to march in Skokie, um, and you know these people are connecting in ways that, you know, and they they, they have that right, and that's the thing, and I mean some of these, if you look at some of these message boards, um, it's like sticking your head in a sewer, but. You know, it, we have the right and the responsibility as well to counter it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we do. It's a huge responsibility yeah. and one we, we have to embrace. What was it that uh, – I think this is a King quote that said, you know, injustice anywhere is a, je- uh, a threat to justice everywhere, or I'm paraphrasing. Exactly, yeah. I'm paraphrasing. And, you know, and um, I'm also reminded, you know, from, you know, this conversation – there is a book called Chasing Space, and it's by a, a gentleman by the name of Leland Melvin. And he is he has the he is in a very elite club of one of the uh, of one of, of some of the very few humans who have ever been off world, off planet, off the planet Earth. He uh-huh. also has the dubious of, distinction of having uh, played in the NFL. So he was an NFL football player and also became an astronaut. And, wow, and so, <laughs> that's a resume. Yeah, yeah, that's a resume for you, isn't it? And so the interesting thing that he talks about is that when he went up into space, when he get when he got when he flew on the shuttle mission, and it was his first time off world, looking at the planet, he he said, all of a sudden he did not see borders or countries, and I'm paraphrasing right. here. He did right. not. He did not see all of the political strife and you know all of that. He just see it was just us, out here, on the planet, and there's right. nothing else out here that we are aware of. It you know in our current state, but he said it changed yeah. his perspective on everything. Mm-hmm. It just changed his perspective, and he says, and it, it was like one of those. It was one of those moments where he said, "Wow!" And when I read his words, and I and I and it, they stuck with me. And I said, wow, when you change your perspective to look at it like that, it changes you. It changes you. Oh, yeah. It changes you. I've often, yeah, I've often said that, you know, discrimination um, and bigotry, those aren't ethereal um, creations. Those are, those are human creations. Yeah, human, very human. Yeah. And so, and so, and so, you know, so when we, when we're talking about, you know, things like, you know, things like this, you know, I just want listeners to understand that this is all, this is all something that we do to each other. And, and one person at a time, we can certainly make shifts and changes, you know, to our own behaviors that can, you know, be an influence to a person in our household uh, or a person in our community or a person in our state or however you go. Uh, or, you know, whatever you have. So let me let me back up again a little bit. And I'm going to ask you a writer's question. Sure. Now, do you write on uh, do, you, do you now when I first started writing, you know, way, way back in the 20th century, <laughs> I used to handwrite yeah. everything. And then back, oh, when, yeah. <laughs> you know, I would have a, I would have to hand back in the Stone Age, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. I would have to handwrite everything, and then I would have to, you know, go and retype it on what was it then a DOS computer, which was a black screen and orange letters, <laughs> which I thought I was like, woo, yeah. you know, I thought it was, woo, but yeah, I remember those, yeah, yeah. coding and yeah, God, WordStar. I think I learned a computers on right. WordStar. Right, but before all of that, you know, people used you know this thing called a typewriter. 
and it's funny i had i have in my nine to five job I, I i had one of my coworkers uh come in and say what's that and it was a typewriter <laughs> How funny is that? So, so do you do you handwrite? Do you use a computer or do you use a typewriter? How do you get? How do you? How how does? What does your process of writing look like? Well, I you know I, I sometimes say that the best class I ever took in high school was was typing, mm. um, because I learned to touch type, and I would encourage anyone who wants to be a writer learn to touch type. It learn to touch type so you don't have to look at your fingers and you you know. You, you could just move those fingers, and the writing process goes faster um, because your th- thoughts are flying and you're getting them down. Um, it's funny because I recall, you know, after I took the class, I was sitting in the typing room where all the typewriters were, and uh, my typing teacher walked in and she said, "I thought you were taking it as a blow-off class." I said, "No, I need to know how to type." Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, I, you know, I did all my writing on typewriter um, through college, and then um, lo and behold, this magical thing called the computer came in. And I've done uh, five books. Well, technically four. I edited one. Um, and I did them all on computer, but I kind of like miss the physicality of the typewriter. And I, for a while, I had typewriter sounds on my computer. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would hear the clack of the keys, um, you know, hitting hitting the platen, hitting the paper on the platen. For those who don't know what a platen is, it's the roller on a typewriter. <laughs> um, I, mean, I have to explain that to people. Uh-huh. Um, but I think you know we went to the American Writers Museum in downtown Chicago, a place oh, everyone that's should a, go that's to. That's a wonderful <laughs> place. I have been there oh. and absolutely, I, I just fell in love with the place. Oh, it's wonderful. Everyone should go there. Mm-hmm. Um, the exhibits they have, the 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 permanent exhibits and the the coming exhibits. Well, they had a typewriter bank, um, and I went there and I just started playing on them. And I, I fell in love all over again, and I said, I've got to get one of these. Um, and so I got a couple manuals, and my kind of go-to now is my Royal uh, Quiet Writer Deluxe. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm learning how to write all over again, it seems, using a typewriter. Um, I'm working on a new book proposal, and I do the drafts on a typewriter. It's a really? machine meant for writing. Oh, I love it. And it's not – yeah, I mean, you're not distracted. It's You, you don't have – Facebook is not, you know, the the siren singing you away from uh, oh, your writing. Oh, that's a good um, point. That's a really good yeah. point because when you sit down to write, sometimes your mind will do that mind wandering thing and go out and say, "Okay, what's on social media?" And if it's on your computer, it's easy to get distracted. I like, I okay. like that. I like that. I may have to, I may have to it's, take you. It's, it's, go ahead. Give it a shot. Um, I it's, it's, I'm having fun with it, and I do my first drafts on the typewriter. And then it, it's real easy to convert it to, like, say, Microsoft Word. Um, you just make a PDF file. You load it up with a Google Docs. And from Google Docs, you can uh, download it to a Microsoft Word. And, you know, you have to reformat it. It comes out a little strange in parts, but um, that's a relatively easy process. So I write first draft. I write typewriter. And then I re- redraft, rewrite on computer. So I'm not a complete Luddite. Um, <laughs> but um, I, it, 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 it has changed my writing process. And... In a way, it's kind of both slowed it down and sped it up. Uh-huh. Um, in that, you know, I can you know pound out more yeah. copy on a type. Okay. Of course, but the stream of consciousness is is uh, you know is there, and you know you have you just give yourself permission to just wail away, and you don't have a computer to uh, you know interrupt. You know, I can say Facebook effect. You know, or the you know what what's what's tweeting this morning, uh, what's trending this morning. Right. Um, or any of that stuff. Um, it's and I, I like manuals. I and mean, some people prefer uh, electric. I prefer a manual. Um, mm-hmm. There's something about the physicality of it. Um, and I'll tell you something. I do. I my old typing skills apparently have, you know, come through the computer age because I've worn out a lot of typewriter or not typewriter um, keyboards mm-hmm. because when you type on a manual. You have to push down a little harder. And since I learned to touch type on a manual, good old Royal Upright. Um, <laughs> I remember. I, uh, yo, they're great. Oh, they're such great machines. Um, but you have to push down a little harder. And mm. so I've worn out a lot of keyboards <laughs> um, because I push down. You know, I, I still do that. I push pretty hard. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this this typewriter kick has been going on for maybe six, eight months. And uh, it's great. I'm, I'm really loving it. I'm really loving it. And it's it's. 
That's wonderful. Same time, it's comfortable. Um, it is funny because uh, I was I was working on something and I had to uh, leave the room for some. So I, I went to Control Save and I said, "Oh, wait a minute, <laughs> you don't do that <laughs> on one of these things." You know, I mean, the only real you know tragedy I ever had was uh, I you know I spilled coffee on some sheets once, or uh, you know I I couldn't find some sheets that I had uh, typed. Oh my God, where are they? I need these drafts, and you know, they, lo and behold, they were in the typewriter case. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, but you know, those are minor hazards compared to. Uh, you know, it, it, it again. I I love it. I'm having fun with it, and it it does add that dimension of fun to writing. Um, you can make mistakes, and it's you know. I I just you know I don't I don't care about you know those gooey whiteout things. You know those you know that just messes up the typewriter too when they flake off into the typewriter. Right. But um, you know, I just you know xxxx X, 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 you know or whatever. It's fun. Um, it's fun. It's productive. Um, I feel creative um, in a way that the computer doesn't feel that creative, um, and certainly easier on the eyes looking at a sheet of paper as opposed to uh, uh, computer, a computer screen. Computer screen. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's a, it's a physicality to it, to the writing, and writing has a physicality to it. There's there's no question. Yeah, it does. Um, Let me ask you this question. This this is this is because you know you and I are both writers, and I like to say that my writing is a byproduct of my reading. And so I oh god yeah and and I love to I love to love 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 uh, reading. Now let oh, me yeah. let me ask you this: If there's a book that you could recommend, your your like you know top you know one or two favorite all time books that you just could read time and again, do you know what those top books are? <laughs> I'm laughing because of how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I can narrow it down to two. Um, <laughs> Well, well, give us two. Um, okay. Um, well, I'll tell you something. Let me let me do this. Um, uh, my previous book to Swastika Nation is a book called Bath Massacre: America's First School Bombing, and it's a it's this horrifying true story of um, a madman who blew up a school full of children in 1927. Wow. Um, and, it, and yeah, what city? What, 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 this what, was in Bath, Michigan. It was a little town outside of Lansing, Michigan. Okay. Um, I mean, we think again. We think uh, you know. Thinking about something current is it, there's the, you know, the ancestors of the past, as it were. Um, you know, I mean, Columbine and Parkland and Sandy Hook are nothing new, unfortunately. This happened in Bath, uh, Michigan, a little town maybe 15, 20 miles outside of Lansing, Michigan. Mm, okay. And the uh, guy was uh, mad and he laced the school with uh, explosives. And, um, it, 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 you know, I, I could go on about this and I, you know, Better look it up on my website, um, and th- there's more detail there. Um, but when I was writing that, I needed models, and I turned to a book that is probably one of the seminal books of the modern age, and that's In Cold Blood by Truman Capote, mm. um, which he calls the nonfiction novel. There's a lot of fiction, and there's a lot of stuff he made up in there. But even so, um, when I finished uh, Bath Massacre and I started – um, I re- reread it before, you know, I went on, you know, tour and speaking and all that. I thought, man, I really absorbed in cold blood because the structure's there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, it's a beautifully structured book. Um, I first read it, I think I was 15, and it scared the hell out of me. And I gave it away because I thought, you know, Dick and Perry were coming to kill me, even though they'd been dead, you know, <laughs> quite some time. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, I got the book back, and uh, it's, I reread it like once. Every year or so, um, it's it's a I, it really is a classic in both storytelling and learning how to write. Um, everything character, dialogue, uh, foreshadowing, um, rise and fall arc of the story um, within the overall arc of the story, as well as within the chapters. Uh, you know, there, there's something about a crime story too that does give you, you know, the perfect arc of a story. You know, mm-hmm. the the beginning, the you know, the the rising action, the high point, the falling action, the conclusion. There's um, the five act structure of Shakespeare, and uh, In Cold Blood does that beautifully. Um, as far as that, that's, we'll call that the, the, the nonfiction, even though it's it's fiction. Um, okay. And I do like um, another book that was highly influential on that is The Executioner's Song by Norman Mailer. Uh, which um, was about the the first when the death penalty was reinstated in the 1970s. A guy named Gary Gilmore um, was uh, brutally killed a couple of people, and he was sentenced to death. And he, w- he said, "Okay, let's do it. Let's have this death penalty." And people fought it for it. it is an epic story, and it's like a thousand page 
book. Um, I think he won the Pulitzer. Um, I'm not. I'm a big fan of Mailer's nonfiction. I don't care as for his fiction, but that's another book that um, I really like a lot. Um, as far as fiction goes, um, I'm a big fan of Philip Roth. Um, uh, I did some really bad impersonations of Philip Roth when I was in high school. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, uh, I also like uh, Kurt Vonnegut's uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, which I think is a beauty of a book. Uh-huh. Um, and Native Son by Richard Wright is another one of my favorite novels. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, those, are, those are like my three go-to novels is, is Portnoy's Complaint, um, although The Plot Against America by Philip Roth is also very good and I think a really good book for our age. It's a alternative history where – uh, Charles Lindbergh um, becomes elected president of the United States, and there's a lot of parallels to what's going on now. Oh wow! This book came out in oh yeah, yeah, I, because I yeah, just... HBO is making a series out of it yeah. um, with Winona Ryder, and uh, it's but it, it, I would I would I just reread it again, um, and it, it, it's it's scary how close it is. Um, but that and uh, you know I mean and of course Native Son, which is just a brilliantly written book, and um, right. It, 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 you re, it really gets pulled into it. That was another. They just remade that for HBO. They gave it a modern, you know. They they, they said in modern day Chicago. I don't think it worked. Um, it's really a book that's set in its time. Right, right. Uh, speaking of Charles Lindbergh, um, it's interesting. Recently, I read another book. Um, it was fiction, but it was called The Aviator's Wife. It was historical fiction. Oh yeah, I, I know Melanie. I know Melanie Benjamin who wrote that. Oh, that was a fascinating book i love that book and i and and i yeah. you know just you you know i don't know you know i, I yeah i could look up what was fact and what was fiction but the yeah. way it was presented as historical fiction of course you know in there there is some truth and fact that that is intermingled in there and I, yeah and it that's that's tr- that's what a lot of non-fiction writers you know try to emulate um in that we don't fictionalize but we take the facts and put the, uh, you know, give it a, like a, we want to take the dialogue, and dialogue is what? Uh, quotes we get from newspapers, mm-hmm. some, uh, you know, uh, official documents, um, transcripts, all kinds of things. Um, scenes, character, it really is the same principles as fiction writing, except we have something real that we have to interpret. Interpret. I'm sorry. Yeah. We have yeah. something real we have to interpret. Yeah. And um, to me, that's the challenge. Yeah, that's and, a re- that, that's the challenge of it all. Yeah, uh, and I always try to, you know, you know, I was given very good advice by um, Jonathan Eag, um before I started Swastik Nation. He's the guy who did the Jackie Robinson book and the Lou Gehrig and that wonderful book on Ali um, that uh, came out last year. And but he said you can have to live with these people in your head for about a, you know a year or two. So be careful what you choose. Yeah, <laughs> you know when I, I but. You know, it's funny when I did my ma- when I did my master's degree, mm-hmm. you know, in literature, I studied historical fiction. Okay. And so it's one of the one of the one of the arguments, you know, that was presented in the in the research that I did was that perhaps historical fiction writers may have uh, an eye towards the truth, towards a more of a realistic truth. That, right. that be, because they they leave in that room for human error and human interpretation of of the work and they and historical fiction writers have a tendency to start in the past and march forward in time whereas um if you know if you're reporting on it you have this tendency to start in the present and look backwards uh in yeah. time, in time at it yeah and that yeah and that's uh, the, the you know, and I have to be careful when I'm doing these things because I want to write. I mean, we have the knowledge. Um, I mean, the, the, you know, the old cliche, you know, is is life is uh, understood backward but live forward. Mm-hmm, uh, yes. When I was writing, um, you know, Swastika Nation, I was writing it from the point of view that this was America and we did not know the full horrors of Germany or what was going to happen in Germany. Um, I had to write it from that perspective, that historical perspective. Which helped a lot inform it because I didn't. It would have been very easy to slide into, um, uh, you know, the monster that you know Hitler was, and you know what what happened, you know, in Germany and Poland in the you know 1940s. Uh, my book ends, you know, the, for the majority of the story, it ends in uh, 1941 before um, you know America is involved in the war. Right. So I and because it takes place largely in the United States. I couldn't put this stuff that was going on in Europe in the book. 
um, other than its tangential relation to what was going on here. This is a perfect time to take a listen to the book, Swastika Nation. Arnie, can you set up the scene just a little bit without giving away too much of a spoiler on what we're about to listen to? Well, what we're about to listen to is pretty, you know, it, the birth of Nazism in Germany and its influence on the, I don't want to say hero of my book, the, the main character in my book, Fritz Kuhn, um, who himself was a born in Germany but came to America where, you know, one thing led to another in his attempt to become the American Hitler. Uh, so this kind of sets up the birth of Nazism. Okay, now we're going to take a listen to Swastika Nation. Swastika Nation by author Ernie Bernstein. On June 24, 1914, the Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie paraded in an open car through the streets of Sarajevo. The pleasantly plump couple seemed to not have a care in the world as they soaked in the cheers from the mostly adoring crowd lining the streets. Yet, among the happy faces were some stern looks, silently holding in their contempt for the royal pomposity, lurking within the crowd, slipping in and out of the throng. Five teenagers, all racked by tuberculosis, tightly held their coats, guarding their secrets. The minutes dragged until one of the young men saw his chance. He hurled a pocket-sized explosive at the Archduke's car. Evasive moves by Ferdinand's sharp-eyed driver couldn't stop the bomb from landing in the automobile. Quickly, realizing what was happening, the Archduke threw his arms to shield Sophie from the incoming firepower. His actions had limited effect. Shrapnel from the explosive cut her slightly along the neck. The chauffeur floored the gas pedal, smashed cars, and injured pedestrians in the confusion. Not once to let an assassination attempt ruin the day, Ferdinand and Sophie next attended a mayoral welcoming ceremony at Sarajevo's city hall. After the ritual pomp and circumstance, the Archduke insisted on going to the hospital to meet people hit by his car during the royal getaway. Apparently, the change in plans confused the chauffeur. He drove down the scheduled motorcade route but was corrected on his mistake and told to change direction. The car stopped. Five feet away, Gabriello Principip saw his chance. Principip, the brains of the tubercular quartet, pulled a handgun from his coat and squeezed off two shots. Ferdinand, the intended target, was neatly hit. The second bullet penetrated the car door, then struck Sophie. Seconds after pulling the trigger, the assassin tried to turn the gun on himself. A mob grabbed him, deflecting any chance for Principip to commit suicide. His second option, chopping down on a vial of cyanide, was an equal failure. The poison within was old, its lethal potency long evaporated. Principip's bullets cut down two people. The war sparked by this assassination ultimately would kill millions, military and civilians alike. And that was a scene from uh, Swastika Nation by Ernie Bernstein. Ernie, tell us a bit about that scene. Okay, first of all, as, as I was saying to you before we got started, um, you have the voice for reading. <laughs> Thank you. I want you to do all my audiobooks, man. You got you got <laughs> the voice. Um, I wish I could speak that smoothly. It's uh, the, you know, I again, my goal here was to put people in the scene. I wanted them to see what was going on, and if you can be in the scene. Um, I, I I teach writing. Um, I teach actually what I teach is a, a basic composition one hundred and one, and. Doing that, by the way, has made me a better writer because it's the basic nuts and bolts stuff. But uh, and what I tell my students is, if you use the senses and use the emotions, no mm -hmm. matter what you're writing, mm -hmm. the reader is pulled in. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I wanted to do. That was my goal with well the entire book, but certainly the first chapter because this um, sets stuff up. This sets up the rest of the book. 
I really um, like how this book does that. It sets up like the prequel, but you know, so that you get to see what was happening before the flashpoint of the war and the and everything that happened, you know, you know, during the Second World War. This really gives you, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, this gives you kind of like that backstory that leads up to this sort of these these historical events. Right. And I, I did need to show Fritz Kuhn where did this guy come from? What made him? But you can't do that without showing Adolf Hitler. And the point that we're in is Hitler's this unknown guy. And that's in the, within that first uh, section is, the, I mean, we all heard of the Beerhold Butch, but what was it? And, you know, the little stuff in there, like, like that he had a toothache and he shouldn't have been there. But he, he you know, Hitler had to be there because he had a, he, he believed in his, his cause, you know, such as it was, um, you know, and all the uh, the action. Um, I think I threw in a lot of good adverbs. I mean, adjectives, excuse me. I think. Mm -hmm. it, um, but I also, you know, I, I want people in there. Um, what was how did World War One get started? Um, you know, all that stuff. And, you know, and then I go into, you know, how Hitler and both Hitler and Fritz Kuhn were more or less in, the, you know, the same position. Um, in World War in World War One. Now, now with that, tell us a little bit more about Fritz Kuhn, because you know, from what I've read, you know, this this man eventually came to America, um, and when he when he came to America, uh, where did he go work? Um, Ford. Uh, he, he was uh, he came to he went to Mexico first, um, which was a common way for uh, young Germans to immigrate to the United States. They would go to Mexico and then eventually work their way um, into the States. And he went to uh, Henry Ford. Um, he, had, he was trained as a chemist in uh, Germany. And so he got a job at the Henry Ford Hospital. Um, and of course. Uh, I mean, Ford was what he was. Um, he was uh, for those who don't know. Who, for those who, for those who don't know Henry Ford, or you know who you know who Henry Ford was in history, and you know some of the things that Henry Ford stood for. Can you give us a little flavor of Henry Ford? Sure. I mean, Henry Ford, in addition to being a genius in creating automobile and mass production, he was also a rabid a Jew hater and racist, um, and used his money and his power to, you know, propagandize against, you know, against Jewish people, against, you know, against black people. He was, that's who Henry Ford was. Um, Kuhn got a job at the Henry Ford Hospital. Uh, of course, he was named after Henry Ford. I and mean, he owned Dearborn, Michigan, more or less, where, you know, the, a lot of this early action takes place. And they had a policy of no Jewish doctors mm. um, at this hospital. Now, you know, I don't want to use the cliche or the stereotype of, you know, the Jewish doctor, but this must have been a paradise for Fritz Kuhn. And uh, it, it it also gave him – he's the most unlikely character you could possibly imagine. Um, he, he's, you know, he's heavy set. He's got thick eyeglasses, um, a thick German accent, and – a real womanizer. Um, he's, he's almost like you know, he's a chick magnet in a way. Um, I don't know how that could have happened. Um, I'll never have a character like him again. It's, it's, he's just an incredible character. The, uh, but he would, he would, you know, do his work at the Henry Ford Hospital. He's an X-ray technician, and he would uh, romance uh, women in the broom closets as well. Uh, and then he took to practicing his speeches. There was a lot of. Uh, Pro-Nazi activity in the area, of course, and uh, you know a lot of these groups were looking, you know, looking at Germany and what was going back in. You know, there were a lot of German immigrants. They were looking what was going back in the fatherland. Um, certainly, there was a lot of prejudices here in the United States against Germans. You know, in the post uh, post-war era, you know, all those names. You know, things like you know, sauerkraut got changed to Liberty Cabbage. Um, you couldn't play Beethoven. Um, of all people, in, in orchestras because he was German. Um, in some places, Germans were dragged in the public square and, and forced to kiss the American flag. Mm. So there was a lot of, you know, resentment's a kind word. Um, and they banded together. And in some cases, as in the Van Steuben Society, it was to rehabilitate and celebrate Germans in America. But then there were things like the Friends of New Germany and the uh, Teutonia, and these were the pro-Nazi movements. 
um, which Kuhn eventually um, collated and unified as uh, the German-American Bund. But he, he was an incredible character. Um, and he, as I say, he practiced, after he was done womanizing in the closets, he practiced his speeches um, and joined the Friends of New Germany, which was the main organization, and rose through the ranks. Um, and when it fell apart, the Friends of New Germany, he reinvented it as mm. uh, the German-American Bund and became what was known as the Bundesfuhrer. Uh, they, they, they could only be one Fuhrer, and that was Hitler, but, but Kuhn wanted the title, so he became the Bundesfuhrer, which is Fuhrer of the Bund. Oh, wow. Wow. So, man, Arnie, this has been an incredible, you know, conversation, just, you know, walking through this and, and learning about, you know, this, you know, uh, the, as, as you say in your bio, you know, maybe perhaps some forgotten history that is, you know, certainly, you know, incredibly important. And, um, yeah. and, and, you know, I, I think that's, I think, I think it's wonderful that you've written this. And I'm also glad to hear that you are teaching writing and, and, you know, uh, uh, you know, teaching a, a new generation of writers, uh, yeah. to, to come along and especially with argumentative essay that you, that you're teaching. Am I right? Did I hear that right? You're teaching. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. so, so, oh, yeah. you know, we I'm a, for, yeah, I'm, I'm a professor as well. And so, one of the things that I think I try to teach students when they're doing argumentative essay is to be able to look at the argument from both sides so that, you know, yeah. you, so that you learn how to argue and f against and for a, a particular point so that you learn how to become a critical thinker. Uh, and so, you know, there's so many people who struggle with, you know, what exactly, you know, that means, but it's important to become a critical thinker about issues so that you just don't follow you know, one person's ideology, you, you question. And I think exactly. you, you, you have to be able to question, you know, certain things. And if you, if you just go along with it because somebody sounds good or they sound convincing, um, that's not going to get you anywhere. I mean, anybody can sound convincing, but, you know, I can lie to you and sound convincing, but is it true? You know what I mean? Exactly. And, and so one of the things I like to do, too, um, I mean, I write about some pretty despicable people. Mm -hmm. You know, not these uh, child killers, things like that. I always, you know, I mean, it's hard to do, but, you know, you want to get inside their heads. I always, or, you know, as such that you can, um, I always try to find something, not necessarily like good, but something that is about them that people can identify with. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of Kuhn, he was, the guy was, he had an, a genius for organization. He took a dying organization um, that was, you know, the nascent Nazi movement in America, and he whipped it up into something that was quite a force in the late 1930s. Mm -hmm. um, my my dad, he's 89, 89 now. He remembers this from when he was a kid. Uh, and, you know, I talked to other people who were elderly, and they said, yeah, we remember this. This was a national thing. So he had this genius for organization. Unfortunately, he took it in the direction that he did. Um you know, it, so you always try to, you know, it, and I would encourage people, um, whether they're writing fiction or nonfiction, when you're writing that villain, what in there can, you know, like it or not, that there's something in there that is a quality that people might want to, I don't want to say good, but uh, the one that the people can understand, um, yeah. as opposed to the monstrous aspects. Yeah. Um, and, and that, that, you know, not to compare, but, you know, just my mind just went here. It made me think of like the Star Wars trilogy when Vader oh, yeah. finally finally became, you know, came out of that darkness, you know, that he was and became, you know, human again. Exactly. Exactly. And there's, there's something fun about writing about villains, too. Uh, yeah. I, they are entertaining, you know, I, they, like them or not, they, they can be really entertaining to write um, and challenging, very challenging as writers. And it's a good challenge. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, it's nonfiction and... Fiction. I mean, you you have the parameters of how you know of the villainy of the person in the nonfiction because you can find what what happened and sometimes oh, yeah. it gets pretty deep. Um, and, and I and think both, in some ways. Oh no, go ahead. It, and both and you know, fiction fiction runs a very thin line towards reality. You know exactly. So so you there's know, there's always the, been there's a there's a, a statement I heard. You know, it's it's you know if. Uh, I don't remember where, who said this or not, but you know, if if uh, somebody had written, let's say, the true story of Scarlett O'Hara, she would say, "My secret's safe." 
But when she read Gone with the Wind, she said, how did they know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and in that, I envy my, my friends who write fiction because they, they can get to a truth that a nonfiction writer can't get to um, through the imagination. But I, I do my best with what I, you know what gifts I have. So, yeah. Uh, so, so Arnie. Anyway, if I, if I, any last advice I can give your your um, listeners: read, um, read, 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 read everything you can get your hands on. Um, and I, you know, there, there's the phrase: write what you know. Um, I always say, don't do that. Write what interests you, yes. and you want to know more about it, and you'll dive deeper into it, and the writing will be better. And pick up a typewriter. <laughs> Learn to well, touch that. Pick up a typewriter and watch what happens. Watch what happens. One last quick question for you: yes, uh, What book are you reading now? Oh man, what book? Uh, this is actually kind of fun for me. I'm reading a book um, called um, Four of the Three Musketeers." It's a history of the Marx Brothers, and I love Groucho Marx and <laughs> their their uh, their stage their stage work. And it's it's fascinating because the research on it is impeccable. Wow. And that's that's the kind of thing I love is is really good research and how it translates to the page, and in just being a Marx Brothers fan, I'm a nonfiction fan, and this guy's research is wonderful, and how he interprets it into the book is wonderful. Oh, okay. Um, I'm having a lot of fun with it. All right. And the book that I'm currently reading is called The Untethered Soul by Michael Springer. It's also a nonfiction book, but it's about how the mind uh, works, and it's a fascinating book about you know, your mind and the, the chatter and the voices that you hear. And, and the one thing that, because we all have noise chatter, we all, we all have mind chatter. And uh, yeah. one, oh, one, of the, <laughs> one of the things that the author says, if you could imagine all of that mind chatter manifesting itself into your roommate and, <laughs> and saying everything that ever went through your mind, <laughs> would that be a really a good really roommate? Man. Is, <laughs> oh, my God. I, when I read that line, I'm like, whoa, you know, that's something else. <laughs> well, Arnie, thank you for being here with us on A Reader's Paradise. I have most certainly enjoyed our time together. And so oh, let's, it's been fun. Yeah, it's yes. It's been fun. I've enjoyed this. Yes. Let's give readers, our listeners, uh, uh, some social media information from you if they want to follow you, buy your Book, oh, sure. that sort of thing. So what's your website? Where can they buy your book? Okay, um my website's my name, arniebernstein.com. Um or they can grab me on Facebook. I have both a uh my regular Facebook, they can find me there. I have a uh, one for my author and also I have a page for the uh, my book Bath Massacre. Um and um let's see Twitter what am I? Uh Arnie underscore Bernstein. Um uh that's my handle on Twitter. Um I'm on LinkedIn, too, if people want to find me there. Um, I don't do Instagram or any of that stuff. I, I can only go so far. No, um, I, I understand. Up with all this stuff. But, um, it, yeah, I'd love to hear from people if, if uh, they have any questions or uh, whatever. Okay. Arnie, again, thank you so much. And that Thank you. I've, I've had a lot of fun with this. You're a good interviewer. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And that does it for A Reader's Paradise. So, again, if you like hearing the interviews that you have uh, hear and if you like hearing the uh, uh, literature and nonfiction performed for you, please leave us a review. And also, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts.